Hello and welcome to a talk about Agile project management. Uh, my name is Teemu Toivonen. I'm, I'm from a company called Triari, co-founder and principal consultant. I've been working with IT for 20 years in, in many kind of different roles, project management, programming, line management, consulting and so forth. And for the last 10 years, will be over 10 years, I've been applying Agile and, and Lean practices and, and learning what works and what doesn't and I'd like to share some of that learning today with you. But first, uh, I'd like to start with a statement. So if you want to be a professional project or program manager nowadays and especially if you're working in, in IT or software development, you need to be proficient in Agile. And the reason is really simple. Everything is faster than it used to be, so nowadays you have to be really quick to get something out. And at the same time, everything is getting more and more complex. You have to think about architecture stuff, it needs to fit in ecosystems, you need to know what EU say, is saying about different sort of regulations and so forth. And just people uh, are expecting a higher quality product or outcome these days. But first, Let's talk about what Agile is not. So when I started in, in software development, we did what was called waterfall projects. So we had this really stage gate type of model that first we really understood the customer requirements. We interviewed, we read, read, uh, wrote a lot of documentation that this is how the software should work. And after we really understood those requirements, we do a lot of design, so if these are the requirements, what kind of design would work, both on the UX side and, and architecture side, so we really designed a good solution. And after that comes the easy part, of course, so we just implement the solution, and then we spend some time verifying or testing the solution work correctly, and then we go live and everything is happy. But in, in real life, it really seldom worked that way. So even though we really sort of put effort into understanding those requirements, we seldomly uh, succeeded in that. So usually the customers or users wanted something else than we thought they wanted. And even in the design phase, when we started actually developing the system, we discovered that actually that kind of design doesn't exactly work. We need to do some things differently. And then in the testing phase, we discovered all of things we did wrong and we didn't have any time or budget really to sort of redo those things so the outcome wasn't what we were looking for and, and the traditional answer was well next time we'll just do better requirement analysis better design better implementation but that also seldom worked and then sort of i don't know if you still watch south park but the underbank gnomes version of that would be that you know let's agree on the targets make sure we have a detailed plan that would clearly separate the phases and then execute and be really careful not to deviate from the plan and succeed. But unfortunately the outcome is the same for the sort of underbank gnomes with their underbank collecting and, and profit making. So uh, in the early 2000s, starting from the late 90s even, uh, another way of, of doing software development was, was sort of bubbling under the surface and it was called Agile. And, and what is Agile? That's a complicated question, but maybe fundamentally it's a set of values and principles. And the values from the Agile manifesto are that actually, even though there is value in, in processes and tools, people and individuals and interactions and, and how they communicate, that's a lot more important if, if we're looking for a quality outcome. And also, even though you might need some documentation, uh, it's a lot more important that we actually have a working software product. So which features are working is a lot more important than how much design documentation or requirement documentation do we have. And then customer collaboration and, and a willingness to sort of be open to changes are, are a lot more important than sort of having a really strict contract with your customers that this is what we're going to deliver or really being strict on and following a plan. Uh, many people just read this first page, the values of the Agile Manifesto. Um, today I don't have time to go into the principles, but I really encourage you to go to the agilemanifesto.org and read the principles as well. A lot of wisdom there. 
Another perspective on Agile, of course, fundamentally, its values and principles, but it is also that we have many different ways of working in an Agile manner, and, and, and sort of new frameworks are coming all the time, and they all have their pluses and minuses and different situations where they work. Scrum and Kanban are, are maybe the sort of most used frameworks nowadays. And today I'm going to focus on Scrum, not because it's the best, but it's a really good place to start and, and you can't really go too wrong with that one. So, if you're doing uh, Scrum with Agile, the roles part is really simple. We only have three roles. So we have the product owner, and the product owner is responsible for uh, prioritization. So talking with all of the stakeholders, understanding what they might need, putting those in priority order, and discussing those needs with the team. So understanding what the customers want, what's valuable from a customer perspective. That's the job of a product owner. Then we have the team. And of course the team is a cross-functional team, so we have all the expertise that we need in that project. We might have UX designers, we might have integration experts, we might have JavaScript coders, developers, whatever, testing experts. But the role is the same, they are members of the team. And there's a reason for that, because in, in an agile way of working we really, really want to emphasize the team. So the whole team is responsible for creating the outcomes that are, that are needed. It's not just my job to test or your job to develop, but it's our job to create a quality product and, and ship it out. And then we have a third role, an important one as well, so the Scrum Master. And the Scrum Master can be a member of the team as well, but they have a special role in that their job is to coach and facilitate the team to make sure that we're collaborating effectively and, and using the principles and practice, practices of agility. But let's sort of look a little bit more in details. How does a Scrum team work? Well, first of all, they have a thing called the backlog. And the product owner is responsible for the backlog. He or she discusses with all the stakeholders and understands what they might want. And then his or her job is to put those in priority order. And those things that are sort of prioritized lower, you can see them as, as gray boxes in the image, they're not that well defined, so, you know, this might be needed at some point, but not yet. So, so we're not going to spend a lot of time in, in defining and analyzing that yet. But those topics that are the most important ones right now, we're going to spend a lot more time, we're going to sort of learn about them, split them into smaller pieces of work. Actually, we're going to split, split them into such small pieces that we can design, develop, and test and put them into production in a two-week cycle. So that uh, sort of facilitates us getting feedback. So it might be a good solution, that's great, we're going to move on to something else, but if not, we want that feedback as early as possible. So that's why we split work into small pieces in the backlog and, and let those ones that are not high priority yet uh, sort of be on, on a more coarse level. So. That's the backlog. Then there's the sprint cycle. So how does the team work? Well, we have the backlog ready and it's prioritized. And, and uh, let's assume that we're doing one week sprints. So every Monday morning the team collects and they have an event called the sprint planning. And, and they sort of discuss with the product owner what are the most high priority items on the backlog. And then they pull as much work into their sprint as they think that they can complete. So not what's scheduled, not what should be done, but what they truly believe that they can complete within the week. So we're respecting team's autonomy to pull work, but they're not pulling work uh, based on their own preferences. They're pulling work uh, based on the priorities of the product owner. So that's the work that they select for the week. Then they track their work throughout the week and, and move it, visualize the progress so what's being developed, what's being tested. And every day they have a 15 minute uh, meeting called the daily stand-up. And they answer three questions. What did I do before the last stand-up? 
what am I going to do before the next one and what issues am I having, where do I need help. And, and the reason that they're having these daily discussions is to create focus. Everybody is focused on, on, on those sprint goals and tasks and to make sure everybody is aligned. We're working together, we're sort of not accidentally doing stuff that, that is in, in con conflict. And also to raise issues as soon as possible and to help. So it's not my problem, it's our team's problem and, and we're collaboratively like, trying to solve that. And we're having those dailies throughout our sprint. And as the sprint comes to a close, it's getting to Friday, we have two events. One is called the demo or review, and the other is called a retro or retrospective. So we demonstrate to stakeholders what we completed during that week. And we, what we almost completed, not what's 80% done, but what's working right now. And they can actually ideally see it in, in a real life environment and use for themselves. After we've demonstrated what we finished, we're going to have a retrospective. So the team reflects on their ways of work, what went well, where are rooms for improvement, what experiments should we try next. So they're trying to discover as effective ways of working as possible in that context. Now that explanation about Scrum was really simplified. So if you're interested in, in this topic, I, I really encourage you to read the Scrum Guide. It's 16 pages, it's not a lot, but there's really a lot of wisdom there. I, I read it once or twice a year and I always sort of discover something new to think about. So, so really recommend reading that document. And how about the results? So is Agile better than tra traditional sort of stage gate waterfall types of approaches? Well, of course, um, context might be different, but in, in software development, in IT projects, we have a sort of a reasonable amount of statistical evidence that it is better. It is not perfect, but it, it will give you sort of a better opportunity of succeeding in your, in your projects. So that's why sort of it, it has become the de facto standard in, in, in modern software development projects. And sort of the values, principles, Scrum, that's a good way of getting started. But I like to also understand why things work. So three sort of key concepts that I'd like you to get, get from this talk is the value of small batch sizes and the value of effective communication and adaptivity. So how do we adapt to change? Well, first, small batch sizes. I'll leave the theory to you. If you're interested, please look up Lidl's law. But in most systems uh, that sort of uh, are stochastic by nature, so there's variance, you can improve that system by just having smaller batch sizes. So doing things in smaller pieces will, will sort of give you an, a definite advantage. And um, if you're comparing to sort of waterfall batch sizes, well, waterfall maximizes batch sizes. So you do all of your requirements, you do all of your design, all of your execution, all of your test. So that's the largest batch size you can have. In, in Agile, you're trying to minimize batch sizes. Let's do requirements design, development, testing to a really small thing. Let's really release that, then work on the small thing. So you're trying to get to a, sort of as small of a batch size as you can. And if we're looking at the economic impact of that and risk impact, here's sort of an assumption that we're building a, a piece of software. And, and of course, each, each month our development team has a cost. So it's, it's costing us money when we're developing that. In a traditional approach, it's going to cost us money for 18 months, so one and a half years. And then hopefully it will be a great product and, and it's going to pay off and, and we're going to sort of make money out of that. And of course that's assuming that everything goes well. In Agile, let's say it takes us four months to create the first release. But after that we can add small pieces of functionality each week or each month. So actually we start getting revenue and value early on in the process. So uh, the cost side uh, start paying it itself back during the project. So in an ideal case where sort of they're both successful, even then the sort of return on investment is, is a lot better in, in an agile way of working. But if, if things go badly, 
you're really minimizing your risk as well because it, it's a lot better to discover in a few months that it didn't work than, than working on 18 months and, and sort of really having a lot of costs on your project. And another thing is effective communication. So surprisingly little uh, technology has, uh, doesn't have that much impact in, in many projects. So of course you need to have people who understand that side of things. But effective communication is really key. Getting people aligned on what we're building, what's important, what are the problems, what, sh what should we do about it. And, and there's a good study in the early 80s about effective communication. So the worst known way, in, way to communicate things is, of course, assume telepathy. Well, that's a joke. But actually, you see a lot of this in, 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 in a practical work. But the next, next sort of, and of course the best one is working telepathy, that I really haven't seen. But if we're getting into real life sort of solutions here, the worst way of communicating complex things is writing them down. And that's what often happens. We have these design documents, requirement documents, and we're assuming that the other party will understand them as, as we wrote them. And the evidence is that that's unlikely. Uh, having a phone discussion, that's a lot better. And having a face-to-face -face discussion is, is even better. But the best known way of communicating complex topics is having a face-to-face -face discussion and creating a shared artifact. That means, let's sit down together, let's discuss it, let's write a document, let's draw a picture to make sure that we're aligned and understand, understand each other. And if we're, if we're looking at sort of agile and wonderful, agile really sort of emphasizes frequent face-to-face -face communication. Let's sit down, let's, let's have a discussion over a whiteboard, let's make sure that we model this with a pen and paper and understand what we mean. And in, in, in sort of waterfall approach, you really focus on writing down a lot of documents and using those for communication. And, and that isn't a, a sort of a useful approach in, in complex projects. And then there's of course sort of how do we um, think we reach goals. So a traditional approach is sort of, if we're starting here and we want to get there, we make a really good plan and we focus on executing that plan. But the evidence is that for complex things, that's not a way to succeed. Because in real life, what happens is that you can have your plan and there's a lot of value in, in sort of initial planning. But what happens is that you'll cross what is called the sort of threshold of knowledge. So reality will, will sort of um, have a different opinion on what works than your assumptions. And if we're working on difficult things, that point always comes at some point. And after that, what you need to do is have an experimental approach. Let's try stuff, let's see what works. And of course, in, in reality, it's difficult to know where that point is. So that's why in Agile way of working, we're always doing something small, getting feedback, seeing if it works. If it works, we're continuing with that. But if it doesn't work, we'll discover that soon and we'll have an opportunity to um, try something else, see what works, find a different way to sort of navigate to our target. So I uh, hope you got some ideas out of this presentation and thank you for atten your attention.